This is the 21st in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we're skipping back in the lecture notes, back to the, to the chapter on corners. So the, the idea is simply that we'll allow objects slightly more general to manifolds. They're known as manifolds with corners. And they're allowed to be, in some sense, a little bit more singular. That they're not, not just supposed to be smooth everywhere, but they're allowed to have, uh, to have a sort of boundary to them and a corner to them. For example, a solid cube is a manifold with corners but it's not a manifold in the usual sense. The motivation for corners is very straightforward. Uh, we want to imagine that we have some, some abstract manifold, and uh, we want to co uh, consider how we would get local problems, to, uh, global problems, to be localized. One way to do it might be to try and cut the manifold into pieces. Um, but when we cut, uh, we could introduce some kind of a boundary. But if we cut again, we could introduce some kind of a corner. Um, we could end up with corners here, 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 here. Um, so we need to be able to deal with objects a little bit more general than manifolds to allow them to be, be cut. Um, so the, the standard example, um, the standard corner uh, is, um, is just uh, uh, the uh, interval starting at 0, including 0, and going out to infinity but n times, n copies of that half-open interval. Um, so uh, so in a picture, the, the two-dimensional, uh, well, the one-dimensional standard corner uh, is simply the, um, the, uh, the interval 0 to infinity. Um, so we include 0, and we go out this way. Um, so that's one example. In dimension 2, uh, that's almost the same story, uh, we have the plane and the two-dimensional standard corner is this set here, which in our notation is zero infinity, two copies, uh, product of twice. Or in other words, you could say in the xy plane, this is the set of points where x is greater than zero and y is greater than zero. So the standard corner in n dimensions, um, in n dimensions, uh, 0 infinity to the n is given by setting all the variables xi to have to all be greater than or equal to 0. So the definition of manifold with corners is, is essentially trivial. It's just the obvious thing. So a, uh, a map, uh, uh, let's say from an open, uh, well, let's say from u is open subset of the uh, standard corner in some number of dimensions, and then W, so we make a map. Phi takes U to W. Uh, w is an open uh, subset of this here infinity of the Q. Uh, is said to be uh, C infinity smooth if um, there exists uh, near each point uh, some extension to some uh, open set. So it doesn't have to be globally defined as extension, but at least locally there should be some extension of the thing to some open set of uh, Rp and open set of Rq so that uh, the extension is smooth. Well, to let's say to some C infinity extension. Um, so so locally we can extend the thing to, to be defined in, in, in actual, not, not just for positive values of variables and non-negative values of variables, but, but for all the variables and values nearby. And, and a smooth map with a smooth inverse is called, of course, a diffeomorphism, uh, as before. Um, now, we're not introducing any kind of test for this, so if you were to actually wonder whether or not a map admits an extension, that's a, a difficult issue, but it's, it's surprisingly irrelevant to what we want to do. So we're imagining a map, let's say, from um, the standard corner in one dimension, in two dimensions, the standard corner in one dimension. What we mean by it being smooth, again, is that if you picked a point, let's say somewhere over here, then there would be some way to make some tiny little open set around here to extend uh, your the standard corner to be a little bit bigger and to include some neighborhood of that point and to somehow extend the map to be defined in that region so that it becomes a smooth map. So that's the definition of smoothness. Now that leads to the obvious notion of manifold in that what we do is we simply require that a corner chart or chart uh, is simply uh, is a, uh, a set u phi u contained in a set M, 
so that it's just a subset and phi is a bijection to an open uh, subset of the standard corner. So in other words, we just take all of our definition of manifold and we just repeat everything what, or where we had Euclidean space. We just use um, we just use uh, the standard corner everywhere. So a chart has the same definition, bijection, and then um, we use the the same definition of um, of coordinates as being um, if the, we have the chart as x is phi of m, then we write x as uh, x1 to xn as usual, and we call those uh, those functions. Those are coordinates. And then um, we have, uh, without any change in anything, we can now just rewrite all of the story of manifolds. Um, we can talk about uh, transition maps. Um, we can be between these guys. Now they're no longer between open sets of Euclidean space, but open sets of the standard corner um, to the standard corner. And only open sets of, they're not defined everywhere, but some open sets of the standard corner, standard corner. Note that one in particular example of an open set, if this is the standard corner, then um, this is an open set of the standard corner. So you don't have to actually touch the walls of the standard corner to be an open set of the standard corner. Um, so in particular, all manifolds uh, will turn out to be manifolds with corners. So, okay, so a transition map has the same definition. Um, smoothness of the transition map is, is the smoothness definition we've just given that has to be a, a smooth map with a smooth inverse where smooth again means you have some near each point, some slight little, little possibly very tiny extension around that point that's a smooth in the usual sense. Um, so then we can define transition maps, we can define a compatibility of transition maps that they have to be uh, that 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 one where they're both defined they have to be um, the sorry compatibility of charts is the transition maps have to be uh, diffeomorphisms we can define atlases as uh, coverings by the domains of 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 the of ch of the charts of a compatible of compatible charts we define a maximal atlas in the same way we define smooth structure in the same way so we now have um, Without change, we've got transition maps. We've got um, uh, compatibility uh, of two charts. Then that they have a smooth compatibility. Uh, that they have smooth transition map. We then can say that um, an atlas is a collection of of compa mutually compatible charts whose domains cover. Uh, a maximal atlas is simply an atlas which is not contained in any larger atlas. And uh, smooth structure. Um, is just a maximal atlas. Um, so we've got all that sort of information. We didn't really need to make any changes to the definitions. Uh, the resulting object is not called a manifold anymore, but just called a manifold with corners. OK, so um, we can also use the same definition for, um, for smooth map of manifolds with corners. Uh, just means that it's expressed in the charts as a smooth map, and then we're again our smoothness requires that at each point that's near the the boundary, at each point of the boundary of the of the of the standard corner, a map to be smooth has to have the property that the map extends a little bit and becomes a smooth map in the usual sense. So a smooth map of manifolds with corners is a map so that when you write it in charts, the, it expresses itself as a smooth map uh, in that sense, in this sense. Um, so we can then, what else do we have? We have, oh, I forgot about open sets. So we have open sets, um, uh, have the same definition. An open set is a set that's, which is locally identified with open sets by all the charts. Um, uh, we have coordinates, which are the, the same definition. So coordinates uh, are just the entries. I wrote that before, the entries of a chart. Um, in fact, we can use the same definition of tangent vector. That's one of the great def, uh, great uh, rewards of the definition we used for tangent vector. It works exactly the same for um, for manifolds with corners. There are other definitions in other textbooks which don't work for corners. So that's why we chose that one. Um, uh, we have uh, tangent spaces. And we have tangent bundles. And they have exactly the same definitions. We won't go back through it all. Um, the definitions are identical word for word in every respect, all these things. Uh, we can also define vector fields uh, are exactly the same things. We have uh, cotangent vectors. 
and we have uh, differentials of functions. We have all that stuff. So everything is exactly as it was. There's nothing really new in the in the story here. Now, um, we want to go back and think about really simple examples because it is a bit confusing. Um, so we said as an example, we had that this line um, with with the point included here that is 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 a manifold with corners because it is after all the sta it is the standard corner and a manifold with corners had to be somehow identified by charts with standard corner this is the one dimensional standard corner so it is identified by itself by the identity map and that's an atlas. Um, uh, on the other hand, you could say, well, what about this guy? What if I delete that point? Then it also is a manifold with corners because it's identified as an open subset of that one by the identity map that includes it in here. Each point sits in here as a point. This point happens to be deleted. That's fine. You can delete some discrete set of points, for example, and you don't change the fact that that's still an open set in that. So it is also a manifold with corners. Um, so we might wonder, is there anything that isn't a manifold with corners? Well, of course, all of our manifolds uh, any manifold without corners, uh, this is the, where the terminology is very unfortunate. Uh, any manifold is any manifold is a manifold with corners. It just happens not to have any corners. And that's why the term with corners is really bad. It shouldn't have been with. It should have been something like a manifold which is allowed to have corners or which possibly has corners. Because the terminology as we've, as we've defined it here allows every manifold without corners to be a manifold with corners, which where the English word with just doesn't fit here. We really want a word that allows for the possibility of corners, which should have been a manifold, which could have corners, but we'll always call it a manifold with corners because that's the standard um, expression that's used in throughout the literature, unfortunately. But I want to think about other, let's see, other examples. Well, uh, we can certainly allow the standard corner in the plane, but we can also now allow things like, um, for example, a hollow cylinder uh, without the top or the bottom on it. It has no top or bottom, it just has the side. Okay, no top, um, no top, uh, no top, no bottom on it, then it is in fact a manifold with corners because uh, it doesn't really have to have any corners, but it can have edges because little chunks of it, when I cut off a little tiny chunk of this guy here, this little tiny piece of the of the cylinder, I can make that piece look alike, and here's the standard corner, it looks just like this piece of the standard corner for example. So it's possible to make a diffeomorphism which matches up this uh, chunk of this guy with this chunk of that guy. So it's not too hard to convince yourself that that is a manifold with corners, which weirdly enough has no corners, but it does have boundary points, which our manifolds have not had so far. They weren't allowed to have boundary before. Our previous manifold would have been, we would have allowed ourselves to have a, a cylinder as long as we didn't include any points at the top or any points on the bottom. That would have been fine. That's a manifold because it doesn't have any problem points at all. This thing has problems along the top. It's where it's prevented from being a manifold. Those points are actually, if this we make it be a, this closed cylinder, it has no top, but, but the points along, this circle along here is allowed. So when I say no top, I mean no disc along the top, but it has a circle along the top, a circle along the bottom, no disc along the bottom, and that's allowed as a manifold with corners, but not as a manifold, even though it also has no corners. So this is what's often called a manifold with boundary and no corners. Um, it's a bit confusing. Going back to one-dimensional manifolds and with corners, um, we can also allow something like a closed interval. Um, to, it's a manifold with corners. It doesn't look like the standard corner, but it looks locally like the standard corner because this chunk of it here looks like the standard corner and this chunk of it here just looks like the standard corner drawn backwards and so or at least this looks like the standard corner near one end of it and this looks like the standard corner near the other and so they both look like open subsets of the standard corner you can see by just flipping this thing the opposite direction and leaving this thing the direction it's in already they both look like the standard corner which goes off to infinity so um so so those two pieces look like two like two pieces of this bit here and so they this is in fact a manifold with corners um it has two corners which correspond to this okay so it so this is fine that's allowed um
Another example is, of course, as we said, every every manifold is a manifold of corners. So here's a one-dimensional manifold, which is the circle. It's perfectly fine. It's allowed as a manifold of corners because uh, every little tiny chunk of it looks just like you take the standard uh, the standard one-dimensional corner, and that chunk of that looks like this chunk of this. This little piece here looks like this little piece here. So it's perfectly fine. Um, so this is a manifold with corners. Um, as some examples that aren't manifolds with corners, um, uh, a cone point uh, is not a manifold of corners, and that's a bit hard to prove. Um, but basically, because if you delete the cone point, you cause some kind of singularity that looks looks a little bit weird. Anyway, it's not a manifold with corners if it's a simple cone point, um, and we won't prove that. Um, but uh, but an example that I think is is really important to keep in mind, and a bit confusing. Um, an example of a manifold of corners, which is very important and confusing, is if you take the standard manifold, uh, the standard corner in the plane, but delete the inside of it and just keep the outside of it, the boundary of it, so to speak. The boundary of the standard manifold of corners, that's not a manifold with corners, which is rather sad. Um, it's not a manifold of corners because it has this sharp point in it, so it's not a smooth object around here. And if you look at, if you wanted it to be a one-dimensional manifold with corners, if you want it to be one-dimensional manifold with corners, it'd have to locally look like either, like this guy. Um, so that's our standard manifold with corners. That's okay. And that's okay, because it's the standard surface with corners, standard um, manifold with corner, and the, the standard corner dimension 2, the standard corner dimension 1. But this is not a manifold with corners. It's not a manifold of corners because this chunk of it looks perfectly like that bit, and this chunk looks like that bit as well. But at that corner, it's got two different guys coming in at, at this angle. And this guy doesn't anywhere have two different guys coming in at an angle. It doesn't have two different directions coming into a point at an angle. And so it's with a bit of effort, you can, can prove, and we won't do it, that this is not a manifold with corners. So the boundary of a manifold with corners is, in general, not a manifold with corners. And that's a big problem for our theory. Um, a problem which is solved in, in, in one of the chapters in the notes, but we won't worry about it. What we can say is that this thing is at least made out of manifolds with corners glued together along lower dimensional manifolds with corners. So every manifold with corners has boundary consisting of a bunch of manifolds with corners which are, which are glued together. Um, and that's how we'll, we'll deal with that problem. That'll be enough for us. We won't need to cover the whole chapter on boundary of manifolds with corners. Now, a manifold with corners, by definition, has some kind of charts. Um, so we have our manifold with corners, which is some abstract thing we think of as being somehow some abstract manifold, um, M. Then this little piece of it over here where this corner is, maybe, or some other piece of it, is locally identified by some chart. Some little chunk of it is identified um, with some char by some chart with the standard uh, manifold with corners, the standard corner. So um, so each chunk of it is identified with a chunk of the standard corner. Uh, by definition, that's what our charts are all about. Um, and then we'll be interested in uh, looking at um, a boundary function. Um, so this guy is going to have some, uh, there's going to be some coordinates, x1, x2. So um, a boundary function. f is um, is a function defined on some open set of our, of our manifold with corners m so that uh, there exists a chart in which some coordinates in which f is one of the doesn't really matter which one one of the xi's so that's what we'll call a boundary function. And the notes give a, a, a complicated discussion, well, a discussion which we don't need to go into in detail, explaining exactly how you identify which functions are in fact boundary functions. If you take any chart, uh, this won't be xi anymore, it'll be something else. And we can figure out what something else is, could, could come up. But for the moment, let's just say a boundary function is a function which in some coordinates becomes one of the xi's. Um, so that'll be good enough for us as a definition of boundary function. The notes prove that that's well-defined, independent of, of any choices, that there is a well-defined notion of boundary function. 
um, and uh, they explain exactly how to identify which functions are boundary functions. So then, then the differential of a boundary function at a point, if we have a boundary function, um, it's an abstract manifold with some kind of corner, um, and we, uh, so here's our manifold, and we have a corner, and then we have a, uh, the standard corner, and we have some sort of chart, which is a mapping uh, some region here to some region here, maybe this one. And then we'll have a, a, a boundary function, which will be um, some function, which is maybe this guy, f, in this case, maybe is x2, um, uh, let's say f equals x2, for example. In this case, um, that becomes identified with some function, which is somehow increasing as we go this way. Um, so it's going up this way. Um, and then uh, and vanishing along this guy here. Okay, so there's a, a, a rough idea of a boundary function, and we'll say that uh, uh, we're interested in these, which we think of intuitively as the walls of the manifold. We really think about a three-dimensional example rather than a two-dimensional one, then we, we can really think of them as walls. So um, we want to think of those as walls, although the notes don't, I don't think at any point actually define what a wall is, but that's intuitively what it means by a wall. And so um, a co-wall, um, is um, is uh, a, a covector xi of the form a df. Well, sorry, it's uh, it's not quite a covector. It's actually a ray of covectors. Xi is um, uh, sorry, a, a cowal is a ray of covectors. Um, well, it is xi, and it's um, all the uh, non-negative or let's just say positive multiples of df uh, uh, for some. Uh, at some point uh, for some boundary function f with f at that point being zero. So it has to be in the boundary for that boundary function. So we're looking at this function here and we take and it's going up this way so it's zero here and so it's differential here it's df that'll be our um, That'll be our cowall, or at least the cowall is to be more precise. The, the 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 multiples of that guy. So it's a it's it's a it's a ray. It's not a single vector. It's just a ray of vectors, and we can see that that that's well defined. If we change the 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 choice of the of the variables, will we'll, we change the the choice of the of the chart? Then uh, we could affect this quantity by by a positive scaling, as we can see in some examples. Um, so. Uh, so this is the object we want to deal with, not not with an actual covector, but with a ray of covectors. It's a covector defined up to scaling. Let's just look at an example, um, a simple example that we can do. Um, if we if we looked at um, the standard corner in three dimensional space, um, so X is the standard three dimensional corner, uh, then you could say it's cut out by uh, in points x, y, z, it's cut out by the equations x is greater than or equal to zero, y is greater than or equal to zero, z is greater than or equal to zero. Um, so that means that you have uh, these inequalities, but you could write the same uh, the same set of points using a different set of inequalities. And so it's convenient to think of these things as being cut out by inequalities, right? So a manifold with corners we could think of as intuitively as being cut out by a bunch of, of independent inequalities. But we could replace these inequalities by things like 2x greater than or equal to zero by rescaling. We could also do things like 1 plus x squared y is greater than or equal to 0. That will rescale the y variable by a function of x. So you can see that that's also a boundary function. That's a boundary function. That's a boundary function. And this guy is going to be, let's say, uh, we could take 4z greater than or equal to 0. And that's also a boundary function. z cubed wouldn't work because its differential wouldn't be 0. So it wouldn't be a boundary function. It wouldn't be possible for it to be a coordinate function. But um, but they, these are all also boundary functions. And so these inequalities and these inequalities should be thought of as the same inequalities. And that means that uh, I don't want to think about dx, dy, and dz as being cowals, but I want to think of real rescalings of them. So I'll write it as dx, uh, dy, and dz to mean the rays generated by them. So you take the, the you take your inequalities that cut out your object, you take their differentials, but you don't you don't just hold on to those as covectors, you allow a possible positive rescaling of the covectors. And that gives you coordinate independent information about the inequalities. So that's how we'll store inequality, the differentials of inequalities. We'll store them by their positive multiples. So where this again 
dx means all the positive uh, numbers times uh, dx. So it's the set of positive multiple of dx. So lambda is positive. I think in the notes it's non-negative. It doesn't matter. Non-negative or positive will be fine. Um, so in, in, a, in a simple example, if we had some kind of, of picture of our of a, of, of a manifold with corners, um, if we don't actually know what the inequalities are, but we know it has some kind of picture where it has a, has a corner that looks like this, and here it is, um, then the co-walls um, are supposed to be, at say this point, are supposed to be thought of as being the differentials of functions vanishing on this guy. So I think of my function vanishing on this guy, I think of it as differential. I'll draw a gradient vector, even though I've, I've, I've complained already about gradient vectors being dangerous. I'm really drawing a gradient vector and thinking of the differential as if it were the gradient vector. So this is the differential of one of the constraints, the constraint that, that you have to, to say this should be greater than or equal to zero. There's some function here that also has to be greater than or equal to zero, and so it's going to be having co-wall like this. It's convenient again to use not walls but co-walls um, because uh, walls are bad. Um, walls are made of tangent vectors and they're very, very complicated. But here we only have two functions. We're cutting out uh, we have that this function has to be greater than or equal to zero. Some function here is to be greater than or equal to zero. So there are two constraints, and the two constraints have differentials, which are the co which are co-walls up to up to the positive scalings. So it looks something like that. That's more or less a picture of the co-walls. Although again, they're really only defined up to re positive rescalings. These vectors they aren't actually defined as vectors. Now, intuitively, we'd like to have we'd like to have all of our big theorems. We'd like to have a, a kind of theorem about about um, impl implicit function theorem, which is a very powerful theorem. And we 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 know that implicit function theorem pictures that somehow when you have um, uh, maps of manifolds where the differential is surjective, then you end up with a kind of picture that looks something like this. That it looks like a linear projection. Um, so somehow uh, the picture is this is some manifold P, this is some manifold Q, and our map is some, just a projection map. It's a linear projection map in, in suitable coordinates. So we'd like the same idea to work. So we need to have a notion of what, what that means in the context of corners. And we'll simply say that um, a point uh, P in P is uh, regular uh, for a, a smooth map. Um, so we have some smooth map phi takes P to Q of manifolds with corners now. Now we're allowing corners, so point P, let's say, I don't know, P is in capital P is uh, regular. Um, if um, uh, if um, at the corresponding point Q is phi of P down in the underlying manifold, we have the following. Uh, first thing is that phi star should be injective. And that's the condition of being a full rank. Um, it's injective on co-walls, but it's not just injective, it's injective on co-walls. And um, phi star is injective on, on the quotient space, um, cotangent space uh, quotiented by um, the um, span of the co-walls. And then we'll have, have finally that uh, every boundary function pulls back to a boundary function. Pulls back to a boundary function. So those are three requirements. When you require all three of them, they're independent of one another. So um, so we need to actually require them all, and that'll be what we'll call, what we'll call regular. So it requires a lot more checking. You have to differentiate and check injectivity in the co-walls. Then you quotient out by the co-walls. You still have to have injectivity in what's left over, and those are independent conditions. And then finally, you need boundary functions to pull back to boundary functions. And a, a point, so that's what it means for, to have a regular point. Um, as As always, a regular value means the usual thing. Um, so we can say that a Q and Q is a regular value if um, if um, for any, any P and P with uh, let's say Q naught's a regular value for any P naught with phi of P naught equal to Q naught. If you have any point that maps to that Q naught, uh, P naught is regular. So that's the the definition as exactly before.
of regular fat. Again, points which are not uh, not regular points are irregular points are called critical, and irregular values are called critical values. And um, so, a map is a submersion uh, if all uh, points are regular. All points are regular points, um, and so uh, all values are regular values. Let's let's try a very simple example of an ear of a map which doesn't turn out to be a submersion, even though you might think it would be. Um, so a very simple example, just going to be phi takes um, p, which is the standard corner of three dimensions, to uh, q, but q is going to be the real number line crossed with the standard corner of one dimension. Um, so this will be a very, very simple map, and it's simply defined by um, phi on a point x1, x2, x3. is simply going to be x1, and I want it to be x2. Um, doesn't matter, I suppose. Um, okay, so that looks at first like, well, it's just a linear, it is a linear projection. But in P, all the coordinates are constrained so that they have to be greater than or equal to zero. So we constrain all the x's to be greater than or equal to zero. In Q, the first coordinate is unconstrained and the second coordinate is constrained. And so that's the problem. Um, so it's going to um, require, let's see if I got it right. Uh, 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 oh, sorry, I've got it wrong. Uh, no, it's not the same as my notes. My notes had the opposite order. It should have been zero infinity cross r. So that means this guy uh, is not a boundary function uh, in the in the in the the Q manifold. Okay, so there's something bad happening here. So let's give names to these um, on Q. So on P, I'll have coordinates which are x1, x2, and x3. On Q, I'll have coordinates which I have in my notes I've written as st. Um, and there, the map is given by s is x1, t is x2. So, um, so it does have the property that, let's see, if we calculate what the co-walls are, well, on q, we only have the constraint that, according to this, is supposed to be q, so this is the s and the t variables, s is, is in 0 infinity, t is in r, so the only constraint is s is greater than or equal to 0, and so the only, that gives you the co-wall, which is the multiples of ds. Um, and so we can check that phi star of uh, the cowall ds is by definition the, uh, the, the multiples of phi star uh, ds. But ds, since s is x1, that's uh, the multiples of dx1. And so that worked. That pulled back a cowall to a cowall, and it's injective. So that was one of the first properties. That was property A of a submersion, that all the co-walls had to pull back to co-walls. So that worked perfectly. It's injective on the co-walls. OK, but if you take the, um, the next property, which is supposed to be the quotients by the co-walls, so we take um, the quotients, uh, we take all the cotangent vectors, uh, the span that I'm, I'm sort of using the notation two different ways. Here I'm actually meaning co-walls, so I'm actually meaning these are positive multiples. Um, so let's, uh, maybe I'll need another notation then for span. The span of the ds and dt's is the whole cotangent space, but I'm going to quotient out by the span of the co-walls, which is the span of the ds's. Um, that's got to pull back. Um, and what does it pull back to? So the span of this quotient um, uh, it's got to pull back to um, the corresponding point. And then we're, let's just work at the origin just to make it easy. Um, it's got to pull back to um, to the to what? Well, this is going to pull back by ds. Uh, pulls back to x1. And dt pulls back to dx2. Um, quotient by the span of, of ds. Which is the span of dx1. But it's supposed to pull back to, it's not working, because uh, the, the definition required that it should pull back to uh, the span of, to the quotient of um, uh, T star uh, at the origin of the P manifold uh, modulo the, uh, the co-walls, the span of the co-walls. Um, and at that point, that's just, well, uh, you've got all the dx's in the P manifold. But then everybody's a co-wall at that point. 
So um, because all the they're all constrained to be positive, uh, dx one two three are all constrained to be positive, and so that's zero. And so this can't injectively, this one-dimensional space here can't injectively pull back to this zero-dimensional space here. So it doesn't work. It's actually zero mapping on this one-dimensional space. The the span of the co-walls, um, the the the, the, the cotangent space modulus span of the co-walls. It's not pulling back. It's pulling back to this to something that's one-dimensional. It's supposed to pull back to something zero-dimensional. So that's not working. So that property fails. It's a quite a sophisticated definition. It really requires you to work with quotient spaces, the vector spaces, and it uh, it really requires you to work these 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 things out carefully um, and figure out what are the quotients that we're dealing with. So a, a more geometrical example where you can sort of see everything rather than doing any linear algebra, um, we could just look at a um, simple example. You take the square and sit inside it the disk closed squares, closed disk, and so P is the disk, and Q is the square, and you've included one into the other. Um, so it does turn out to be very close to a submersion because the co-walls pull back to co-walls. That is to say, um, well, I'll leave you to check, um, but it doesn't work that boundary functions don't pull back to boundary functions because the boundary function of Q, so Q is the square, uh, the boundary function of the Q it has, let's suppose our coordinates are say x and y, um, then dx uh, is a boundary function here, dy is a boundary function there. Let's just look at this point. dx is boundary on Q, uh, but the pulls back uh, it does not boundary on because a boundary function has to vanish along a p along a chunk of the boundary along a, one of the one of the faces or walls. And this guy doesn't have any such. It only has this one wall here, so to speak, and and it and the boundary that boundary function isn't vanishing along there. The function x vanishes here; it doesn't vanish there. And so that's an example where you can see it's not a submersion. Okay, so let's prove the implicit function theorem um, for manifolds with corners, which is a very straightforward um, thing to do. Uh, so this is our implicit uh, function. Implicit. It should be called implicit map theorem, but it's always called the implicit function theorem because it's it's, it's history and calculus. Um, and it says that a submersion, every submersion, um, is just uh, locally as a linear submersion of corners, or linear surjection of corners of well of standard corners. locally. Everyone is locally identified with the linear, with the standard linear submersion of corners. So the, the rough idea of the proof, I don't want to do it all in all detail, but it's very straightforward, is that you have these boundary functions on the Q manifold downstairs and you pull back to boundary functions. Um, their uh, their associated co-walls, which are essentially their differentials, are the differentials of those boundary functions, remain linearly independent. And so you can use them as still as coordinate functions locally um, to create some some coordinates in which they in which they continue to be coordinate functions. So they continue to be boundary functions. Um, so then so then we've you've got part of the mapping done. So you have boundary functions, let's suppose they're xi's, and then you've now got, so xi's are also uh, boundary, they're also coordinate functions on P uh, for some kind of coordinates. Um, so that's the, the first step. And then um, what you, what you want to do is, um, is to uh, make sure that, that the differentials of the remaining functions remain when you quotient out by those boundary functions, you quotient out by those differentials, you've still got some other functions which, whose, whose differentials are not boundary. Um, so you have more um, xi's which are not boundary. Um, there, because you haven't used maybe all, all the coordinate functions. Certain of the coordinate functions are boundary functions on Q. Certain of the coordinate functions you're you're not in. You're somehow in the middle, in the interior of Q. For those ones, they're actually positive. You're not right on the boundary, so they're not boundary functions. But they still have to pull back to have independent differentials. Uh, modulo the ones you've already used, and so they correspond to some additional coordinate functions you can use on P, and then you can add some more coordinate functions until you have a full set of coordinates.
So, um, so I won't go through all the details, but that's the rough idea. And as a trivial consequence of the implicit function theorem, um, you get uh, the um, the uh, uh, inverse function theorem. Inverse function theorem, which is simply says that um, if you have a, a p to q, and this guy is uh, is um, a uh, map of manifolds with, let's say, so a smooth map um, uh, with dimension p equal to dimension q, and suppose that you have a regular point, it's a regular point, then uh, there exists um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, some charts, some coordinates in which um, uh, it's a diffeomorphism. Well, I should maybe just say that it's locally a diffeomorphism. Um, uh, locally doesn't matter really about charts. It's locally a diffeomorphism. That is to say, it's it has an inverse. So you just calculate out coordinate charts in which this thing looks like a submersion, but this uh, linear submersion, a linear projection operation. But the but the 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 fact that it's a regular point means that it has to actually be a linear isomorphism and has to you know isomorphically map the various uh, the standard corners to one another. We can also get Sard's theorem that says that um, so Sard's theorem is almost trivial now um, that uh, the the um, uh, that um, the critical points critical values are measure zero. There are multiple ways to prove that. One is simply that, by, almost by definition, our, our maps when it allow some extension in some local coordinates. Um, in some local uh, coordinates, we can we can extend them a little bit uh, outside. If we said that the smooth map, uh, you could always sort of locally extend it, smooth map on a corner, extend it to be smooth map uh, a little bit further, and uh, and then you could just apply the Sard theorem there. So that at least convinces you it should be true. Um, because after all, the picture is more or less that the maps that we're dealing with are the same sort of maps we were dealing with when we didn't have corners, at least locally. Uh, so they should still have the same property of measure zero, um, uh, of, of, of measure zero critical values. Because you had a big chunk of critical values in here somewhere. They'd have to be somehow, um, another way to think about it maybe, uh, if you had a big chunk of critical values that made some, some big set, then, then part of that would have to occur inside the inside the manifold. So, um, so it's not too uh, surprising then that you get a Sard theorem. A simple result about manifolds with corners, which I will state and is given as an exercise in the in the lecture notes um, using the theory of notion of vector fields, um, uh, is that um, every compact uh, curve with corners is um, a finite uh, disjoint union of up to diffeomorphism, a finite disjoint union of uh, intervals and uh, circles. So, um, so it's finitely many of these, finitely many of these, um, and so so this is a is an important. Um, Important result. It has a sort of trivial corollary that um, a compact curve um, has an even number of ends. Uh, that is to say, corners, because this guy has two and this guy has none. Um, so I'll leave you to check this. It's not very difficult using a uh, notion of vector field to flow along the thing to create a local flow along the, along such a, a compact curve and then uh, to use that to construct a parameter in which it's identified with one or the other. So I won't do that. Um, let's see if we can apply that result. Um, it's a nice result. Uh, it has a lot of applications. That there are that curves have two ends or even numbers of ends. Um, Let's uh, get a result about manifolds with corners. Where we're really using corners in, in a serious way. This is the Brouwer uh, fixed point theorem. These fixed point theorems are really quite practical. They have real significance in trying to solve equations. Um, uh, that every uh, smooth map um, phi takes b bar to b bar. Or B bar is a uh, um, closed ball, 
and that's not a manifold, right? Closed ball in Euclidean space. Um, so that means, of course, a closed ball, it's not a manifold anymore because it's got boundary points on it. Um, so manifold has just the interior, the inside. This guy's got the solid interior, but it's uh, it's also got the boundary attached to it. Um, then uh, every such thing, uh, every, so I'll put, put that in parentheses, every smooth map has a fixed point. And that's not obvious, and that's in any number of dimensions, right? So they always have fixed points. Okay, so we want to give a proof to this. Um, let's do it as follows. Um, so the proof is, um, let's let S be the boundary of the ball, and then, uh, so the sphere, which bounds the ball, and then suppose phi takes the ball to the ball, I'll put the bars on it to remind us there's a closed ball, not an open ball. Um, there's no fixed points. Suppose it has no fixed points, and we want to drive a contradiction. Then what we'll do is we'll define a new map, which I'll write as G, and it takes the ball uh, to the sphere by taking X maps to G of X equals um, the point uh, Y in the boundary sphere so that um, the line... Um, from, what do I want to do? I want to go from uh, phi of x through the point x hits the boundary s at the point y. So in a picture, it's very easy to draw what I mean. I have some map phi, and it takes the ball to itself. It takes a point x to some point phi of x and they're not equal. X and phi of X are not equal because there's no fixed points. So we're assuming how, no fixed points and we're trying to derive a contradiction. So we assume those are not, that's not a fixed point. So let's draw that same point X, second copy of it, exactly the same point X over here. And then we're going to go in the line from uh, phi of X through X and hit a point Y on the boundary. And that point we'll call G of X. Y equals G of X. So that's a map G. Um, Give us a map G taking the manifold to the, the the solid ball to the to the boundary of the ball. So um, I won't prove that map smooth. I'll leave you to check that that map is actually smooth, and uh, we'll try and understand uh, something about its behavior. Um, uh, by Sard, uh, we can say that uh, G by Sard's theorem, uh, G has a regular point. A regular, um, sorry, regular value. Um, um, let's say uh, y not. Um, so that means the set, uh, let's call it C, is the set of points uh, x in the ball such that g of x is y not. That's the the preimage, right, of y not, and that's got to be a smooth curve. But it could have boundary. It doesn't have to be a smooth curve without boundary anymore. But it has to have. It has to have. It, it has to be a smooth curve, possibly with boundary. So we've got our ball um, B bar, and then we've got this curve C, which is somehow living inside it, um, starting at some point, and then maybe wiggling around, and maybe going to some other point, and then ha maybe having some circles as well and maybe another component over here. It's a curve. We don't know that it's a connected curve. We only know that it's a curve. It's a smooth curve. So in particular, it's a smooth number of copies of the interval, um, of the closed interval, and a smooth number, of, uh, smooth collection of circles. It's got some of these and some of these. It's got some intervals and some circles. All right, now um, by the, um, the implicit function theorem, because these are this is a regular point. This is not only a smooth curve. It actually um, it actually hits the boundary by um, by uh, so to speak um, uh, something that looks like a linear submersion. Um, so implicit function theorem says that um, C looks like um, we have some linear submersion, and it has to look like a fiber of a linear submersion uh, near any boundary point. Um, near any boundary point of C. So it actually has to hit the boundary uh, of, this is supposed to be an open set inside um, inside our ball, and this guy is going to be the boundary sphere. Um, 
and so in the picture inside the, the, the curve actually has to hit this thing in a nice transverse way. Okay so now we have to figure out what this has to do with, with, with the definition of the map. Um, so if, um, if X is, in, uh, is a point in, in C that intersects the boundary, so it's this point here, this is our X, um, then what do we have? Um, we have X is in S so um, g of x is equal to x because the definition of g was that it was the line that went through a uh, phi of x to x and to through x to the boundary. But if you go through x to the boundary, and x is on the boundary, you go to x. So um, so it went. Uh, maybe I should draw it again. Um, so we went uh, through the point phi of x. So starting at the point phi of x, we went through the point x. We went out to the boundary, but that means that if x was on the boundary, we went from phi of x to x, and there, where, where was x? So that must be the point we ended up at. It must be g of x is x, and so it's a fixed point, um, uh, fixed point of g. Um, but um, by definition. Of, oh, sorry, by definition of G of the curve C, curve C is the preimage of Y naught. So um, C is the set of points where G set of X where G of X is Y naught, um, and so uh, G of X is X. But also G of X is Y naught because it's supposed to be in this curve. Um, so uh, X is Y naught, and that means there's only one such point X. So only uh, one uh, endpoint x of c, but it, but we we know why not is an endpoint of c. Um, so uh, so it has exactly one endpoint, but that contradicts the fact that we said it has to have an even number of endpoints. Um, so that's the contradiction. And that gives us our proof. Okay, so that's a rather beautiful result because it's a deep topological result that we can force all the maps, all the smooth maps of the closed ball in Euclidean space to have fixed points. In our next uh, lecture, we'll think about how to use, um, I don't need Brouwer, but we'll think about how to use this notion of, of, uh, of a submersion or an implicit function theorem for submersions with corners um, to be able to uh, to think about uh, maps, uh, surprisingly, of manifolds with with uh, of the same dimension, we're going to be mapping manifolds of the same dimension to one another. But then we'll try to deform the map through a homotopy. So we'll be interested in a family of maps, um, a family parameterized by a parameter going this way intuitively that starts with one map and ends up with another. And we'll be able to use our implicit function theorem to at least get some understanding of how such maps typically behave uh, when we go from one such map to another one.